series called All In, and then the next week I did All In Part 2. And so if you were here last week, actually last week was the first time, I, so I've been, you know, doing youth ministry now for seven years, and then uh, I fill in when my dad's out of town, and last week was the first Sunday that I ever, I usually leave in, you can ask my wife, I'm a real big overthinker, and so I always, I always leave after I'm done preaching, I'm like, man, I could have done better, or I should have said this, and I just get like, kind of like, man, I just, I don't know, I know everyone came up and told me that it was good, but was it really good, or are they just trying to be nice, and so, but last week was the first Sunday, I mean, I, I left, I left the service, and I was like, man, bro, you, you did good, and it was because I, I was preaching what I was going through, and I tell you every time I do preach, I always preach what I'm going through. And so last week, I talked about I don't feel like it. Anyone ever in here, just they don't feel like doing anything. They don't feel like coming to church. They don't feel like getting to, going to school. They don't feel like dealing with their kids. And, and so uh, this week, I'm going to do I don't feel like it part two. Uh, because sometimes we, I mean, we felt better after last week, but then Monday rolled around because Sunday will change your Monday, and if it's not changing your Monday, then we didn't do it right. But some of us woke up Monday morning like, man, I don't feel like going to work. I don't feel like opening up my Bible this morning before I got to go to work. I don't feel like talking to God right now. And so I thought, you know what, it would be good to do is do part two of I don't feel like it. But before I get into the part two, um, I just want to just thank um uh, Thank my parents for the opportunity. I love this church. I always say, I mean, I was born in this church, and I'll probably die in this church. People always ask me, sometimes they say, Pastor Brody, are you going to take over the church someday? And can I completely be honest with you? I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what is going to happen. But I do know I'm happy where I'm at. And I love your kids. I love your stu- I love the students that are in my youth group. And I'm just going to keep doing what God told me to do. If that's take over this church someday, I'm going to do it. If God tells me to move somewhere and start my own church, I'm going to do it. Um, y'all, y'all gonna come with me if I do? No, I'm just kidding. Don't. No, we ain't gonna. I ain't gonna be no sheep stealer. Um, but, um, and then so, next thing, uh, if you were here last week, I know I always talk about the Buffalo Bills, and I'm gonna get out of here by 12 because we play the Titans today. Um, but I also, besides the Buffalo Bills playing today, we lost to the Patriots by six points last week. And the Patriots be like destroying people every week by 40 points. And the Bills only lost by six. And we threw four interceptions. Like, come on, we could have won. And so aside, sometimes in life, like, we, we might have, like, lost a battle. But we, we need to be excited about it because we're like, man, we were so close. Right? And so um, I'm also not only am I hyped about that game, but I'm playing Mitchell James in fantasy. Is he in here? Andy, is he, he left. He had to go out. I'm playing Mitchell James in fantasy. And right now I'm up by 40 points from Thursday night football. And so just pray with me and believe with me that I'm going to win because I started off the fantasy season 0-3. And, and I never started off 0-3. So I'm 0-3 right now. Actually, I, I won last week. I beat my sister. And, and you might think, why am I talking about fantasy? Because I put $100. We, we like bet in, in, like in this league. And so we put $100, so if you win, you get like $500. So Lord knows I need it, me and my wife. And so just believe and pray with me that we're going to get it. Um, and then also, um, if you have a phone with you this morning, download the Harvest Church app because you can follow all of my notes from this service. And I love this app that you can follow notes because every Sunday I follow my dad's notes. Not because what I want to know what he's going to say next, but what I want to know when he's going to be finished. And so you want to know, like, at, when he starts getting to the bottom of the, of the notes page, you're like, oh, he's about to wrap up. We're about to get out of here. So if you want to know when I'm going to get done preaching this morning, get the app, download it, and so you can follow me and go through that. And then last but not least, big shout out. One of my best friends is getting married this coming Saturday. His name's Sean. Some of y'all know Sean. He was here in our church for a whole year. He moved back to Minnesota, and I was supposed to be in that wedding. I was supposed to fly there, but with my dad gone and things at the church, um, and then if y'all heard some of my stories from the last couple of weeks, I've preached three Sundays in the last month out of four. Like, that's, like, big for me to do. And so um, and so I, I'm not going to be able to make it to his wedding, but I, he told me he watched last week, and he's watching right now. So, Sean, I love you, man. Go marry go marry your girl. So get that. Yes, I love Sean. If you, if you knew Sean, nicest person you'd ever meet. I've never met anyone nicer than this guy, more genuine, more full of love. And um, I told him, I said, listen, after you get married and you do all that honeymoon stuff, I said, me and my wife, we're going to fly up to Minnesota. We're going to hang out. And so just want to say I love you, Sean. And so if you were here last week um, and we talked about I don't feel like it, and we looked at a story about a man, um, of the story of the pool of Bethesda and how the man had an unconditioned, that unnamed condition. And we looked at 
how sometimes he didn't feel like getting up. We looked at three things you have to overcome whenever you don't feel like it. One of them was the discouragement of disappointment. The other one was anger from the lack of assistance. And the other one was misery of missed moments. And so this morning, I want to talk again about I don't feel like it part two slash just do it. Look at your neighbor and say, just do it. Even when you don't feel like it, just do it. And I have a, a message from a good friend of mine that I want to show a video of before I get started in this message. So if we'll roll that video clip of just do it. Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Do it! Some people dream of success while you're gonna wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. You should get to the point where anyone else would quit and you're not gonna stop there. No, what are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. <laughs> All right, so look at your neighbor and say, just, that's my good friend Shia LaBeouf. If you don't know who that is, he's a movie star, actor. We go way back, so I just ask him to, you know, do that. But can we pray this morning before we get started? Bow your heads. God, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. We just thank you for who you are, God. We thank you that we might all be going through something and other people, sitting, the person sitting beside us might not know what we're going through, God, but you know what we are going through. And when, whenever when we don't feel like it, God, we're just going to do it anyways. We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for Harvest Church. We thank you for everything that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with me, will you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5? We're going to look at kind of like what we did last week. We're going to take a story and we're going to we're going to mix it up and dissect it and because these stories in the Bible will change your life. And a lot of times we can just read them really fast and not get anything from it, but I believe that there's in each sentence, each line, each word in the Bible there is something for us because why would it be there if it wasn't for us? If we didn't need it, it shouldn't be in there. So every word, every sentence, every line means something. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 13 and 14 this morning. It says this, But his servants caught up with him and said, Father, if the prophet asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not this simple wash and be clean? So he did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, following the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed, and it was like the skin of a little baby. He was as good as new. So like I said this morning, sometimes we don't feel like it, but we just have to do it. And Just Do It actually came from Nike, and it was a company, and everybody knows who Nike is. It's actually the biggest brand from the 20th century, if you didn't know. The bit more bigger, uh, more people know what the Nike sign is than actually the sign of the golden arches, which is McDonald's. Can you believe that? McDonald's used to be the biggest thing that everyone, people would see and be like, oh, that's McDonald's. And that's, I'm loving it. Well, we ain't loving it this morning because we don't feel like it. So we just need to look at the Nike sign and say, just do it. And so the slogan actually in 1988, it came out with this slogan. It says, um, just do it. And it's the number one tagline of the 20th century. The number one tagline. And they're not a religious company. They're not a Christian organization. But I believe that we can look at this slogan, just do it, and we can actually believe that God is telling us in our own life, just do it. Look at your neighbor and say, just do it. So after all, like, the preparation, the hard work, the preparing, the praying, there's times where you have to start actually executing in your life, from planning to performing, from talking to actually walking it out. And so the word execution, it's, uh, the phrase just do it emphasizes the art of execution. And execution actually means this. It means the carrying out or putting into effect a plan or course of action, acting on our intentions. So we need to execute some things in our life even whenever we don't 
feel like it. And can I tell you something this morning? God has a plan for your life. You're not the only person that has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, not to harm you. And the message translation actually says, I'm planning something great in your life. Do you believe that God's planning something great? Even whenever you don't feel like it, even whenever you can't see it, God is planning something great. See, God wants to show us what to do. And so then we have to actually do it. And then whenever we do it, we experience what he actually want to do. And that's execution. In Ephesians 3.20, my favorite verse ever. I actually had this big on my car when I went to college. I drove an Escalade EXT on some 24s. That was whenever I thought I was black, guys. And I was like, man, I'm going to college on some. It was all blacked out. And so I had a big sticker on the back. And it said Ephesians 3.20. And people would always ask me while I'm driving, why, why do you... Um, why do you have that scripture? What does it mean? It means my God can do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think according to the power that's worketh within you. So you might think, you know what, I'm underqualified. How am I supposed to have some power that's working within me? How is God supposed to do this extravagant thing in my life? Because I don't really feel like it. But God used so many people in the Bible that were underqualified. So many people, and I've told you this list before, maybe a couple years ago when I preached, but I want to read some people that were underqualified, but that experienced the abundant life, the Ephesians 3.20 life. Noah, he was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Isaiah preached naked. Not here. Job went, maybe some capri pants that I rolled up or something, but I ain't preaching that. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. Three times, not just once, but three times. And if God will use these people in the Bible, he will also use you. But there's some things in our life that we have to execute and just do it. All of life is about executing. Prayer, executing. Praise, executing. Giving, executing. Worship, service, executing. And I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is an actually, he executes things. He doesn't just talk about it, but he is about it. And he performs some things in our life. James says in, in, his, in the book of James, he says, we can't be do, only hearers of the word, but we also have to be doers. Can I tell you something? Just because you hear something that makes you feel better doesn't make you better. Just because you hear something doesn't make you better. Doing the word and executing it is about, isn't about mastering it, but it's about mastering me. It's not about mastering the word all the time and figuring it all out and always being able to do it, but it's, hey, I'm going to execute it. I'm going to master me. And see, prayer, worship, anything, prayer isn't a problem. It's, it's a me problem because if I actually pray, then prayer is going to work. Sometimes I was like, I got a worship problem. I just can't worship. No, you got a you problem because if you actually worship, it's going to work. Oh, I got a giving problem. I just, I, sometimes I want to keep my hands in my pocket and keep my money because giving doesn't work. No, 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 you don't work. So we have to execute some things. And Paul talked a lot about this. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he actually talked a lot about this because there's an old man and a new man. And Paul's saying the old me is trying to talk to the new me and trying to get me like the old me. And the new me is trying to talk to the old me, and he's trying to get me to be the new me and the old me. And so you just got a battle going on, going on right there. And, and he's like, which me are you actually going to get whenever you meet me? Because there's times in my life when I'm driving, the old me's there. I'm like, you cutting me off. It ain't working. The old me's going to try to come out. But what day are you going to meet me? Or maybe, maybe there's a new day. It's a new me. And I'm like, man, I'm chasing this giant. I'm going after this giant. And I'm ready. And I'm ready to execute. And Paul gets so frustrated because he's battling the old me and the new me. I don't feel like it. I feel like it. And he, and he gets so frustrated that he says this in Romans 7, verse 24. He says this, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subjected to death. But can I tell you something? This is the time where whenever you don't feel like it, you got to do it anyways. You know, I'm tired of just making noise. I'm ready to make movements in life. I'm tired of just talking about being great. I'm ready to be great. I'm tired of just talking about, man, I'm going to go all in and I'm going to start serving at Harvest Church. I'm tired of just talking about, I'm ready to actually make some moves and start doing it. I'm tired of just talking about trying to change the world. I'm ready to change the world. But I got to start with Lubbock, Texas first. 
Start where you're at, even whenever you don't feel like it. And so I want to look at this story in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. It says this, Naaman was a general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master who held him the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram. A truly great man. This man was a great man. And then it says comma. Why? Because we all have commas in our life. It says but. Because we all have, man, we can be great, but then there's an area that we're weak at. And it says this, but afflicted with a grievous skin disease, which is leprosy. Some of your translations say skin disease. Some of it says leprosy. But isn't it funny that people will see your armor, but they won't see what's underneath the armor, which is, in his case, leprosy. They'll, they'll see your success, but they won't, they won't see your stress. They'll, they'll see your glory, but they won't see the story behind all the glory. They'll, they'll see what your passion and everything you've done, but they, they don't see what you had to go through to actually get there. And so leprosy is actually, it's a skin disease, and it starts eating your flesh, and it creates these sores on your body. And you got to actually, if you, don't, um, if you don't put stuff on it and protect it, then it'll actually, you can become paralyzed in these spots. So if you, if you got some leprosy on your back, if you don't treat it, then you actually will become paralyzed in your back. And then it also is so bad that if you start itching your skin, your flesh actually starts coming off. And see, leprosy is something that you cannot fix. No man can fix it. But only divine intervention from God can fix this. So what leprosy do you have in your life that you can't fix but only God can? Think about it. What do you have in your life whenever you feel like, man, I've done all I can to do. I've done everything I can, everything I can, everything I know, but nothing's working out. Like whenever you're working on your marriage, you're like, man, I'm trying, but it's still not working out. Or maybe your kids, I'm trying to get my kids to serve the Lord, but my kids aren't serving the Lord. And I'm doing everything. I'm trying to make them come to church. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? And God's like, you can't fix that. No, you can't, but I can. And there's only things that God can fix. Have you ever noticed in church we, we always talk about testimonies of us in winning situations, but we never talk about when we've taken any L's in life. And I really want to ask this question. I, want, I feel like we can be truthful in church because I don't ever want to be a church that is unhonest or we say one thing and we're really going through another thing. But can I see a show of hands at anyone in life that started following Jesus and maybe has taken some L's in this life? Can I just, come on. And in life, sometimes we're going to take some L's. What about the times whenever we ran away from the giant and not towards it? Or what about the times whenever we tried to knock down the giant and he didn't fall down? I remember um, this just happened, and I was, I've told some stories on the ca- couple past messages. But when me and my wife were trying to sell our house and we sold it and the people didn't come through for our house, we actually found a house that we loved. We thought our house was already sold. And Johnny can... can confirm all this because he's my realtor. We found a house and it was actually right down Upland and the backyard, if you looked over the fence, it was our church, 66 acres of land. And so me and Jensen were like, this is our house. Like we love the house. We're like, man, if Jesus tarries and someday we take over this church and our church is on this land, I'm just gonna jump the fence and walk to church. I can wake up like 10 minutes late and still make it to church. And I was just like, we, we knew this was our house. We're like, man, the God, like, you're so good. We, we took our parents over there and had them look at it. And then we took uh, Jensen's parents and we, we just showed everyone. And we drove by, in order to go to my parents' house, you had to drive by this house every day. And we always go to my parents' house. So every day we drove by and we'd be like, those are the shingles on our roof. That's our backyard. That's the shop in the backyard where I'm just going to have a heyday. I don't, I don't really work that much, but I just want to shop, you know. So, and I just kept, we kept believing. We're like, that's the fence. That's our fence, and we just kept saying this, and then our house fell through, and then someone else bought that house. And we kept thinking, man, like, this is a big L that we took. And it it hurt, but like we talked about last week, if it's not better, then God's not finished. And we moved back into our house, and you know what? It's not where we want to be long term, but you know what? We know that God has a bigger plan. Maybe we're going to have a better house. Maybe we're just going to build a house on that 66 acres. I don't know. But God is good. And so Naaman is actually, he's dealing with this same issue. He's like taking some L's. He's living with leprosy. And he's been taking all these L's and he doesn't know how to get rid of this leprosy because it's uncurable. And so what we talked about last week too is you need people in your life that where you don't have to go through things alone. And Naaman is actually, he has someone in his life at this time where he doesn't have to go through this alone. 
And we did a, we did a, a series a couple years ago in my youth group called Squad Goals because you need a squad in life. You don't just need some friends, but you need a squad. You don't just need people that you can go to the mall with, but you need people that you can build a dream with. And so Naaman actually has this, and I, and I, and I want to look at it here in the Bible in just a little bit. Um, but I believe that God's going to give us people in our life just like Naaman had that are going to be a strength where we are weak at. And he had someone where he was weak in this area and someone had strength in that area. And it was actually a lady that worked for him. And anyone have weaknesses in here? Can I show it? I asked my wife, we were driving the other day, and I'm a kind of like dog on myself, I guess. And we were driving. I said, babe, I said, what do you think my weaknesses are? And she started naming some stuff, and she said, no, no, no I, let me just, <laughs> she's like, no. <laughs> and so I said, what do, what do you think my weaknesses are? And she said, she did say, she said, you overthink a lot. You're just an overthinker, like I told you in the beginning of my message. And she said, oh, wait, no, that's not it. And then she named something else. And she said, oh, wait, no, 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 that's not it. And I said, it like brought me down. And I was like, dang. I said, well, do you know what? Good thing all these areas that I'm weak in, you are strong in. So you need people in your life or whatever you are weak that they are strong. And so Naaman actually had this, and he had a woman who worked for his wife. And while everyone else saw his armor, she saw his leprosy. She was drawn to it, not away from it, but she was drawn to his leprosy. You need people in your life that are drawn to your leprosy, that are drawn to your weakness. A lot of people, they see weakness, they're like, oh, no, I'm not going near that. You need people that are going to draw that, like, I want to make that better. I want to make you better. Because you know you got a good one whenever they don't only love you for your best, but they also love you for your worst. And so in 2 Kings 5, 3, it says this, One day she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. So see, this woman, she was actually captured. And she didn't belong in this kingdom. She wasn't a part of this kingdom. She said, you know what? I know someone from my kingdom. In your kingdom, you're going to stay broken. You're going to stay disgusted. You're going to stay with this leprosy. But in my kingdom, you can be healed. In my kingdom, we can actually make you better. Can I tell you something? There's things in your life that you could never fix. But in God's kingdom alone, he can fix it. Amen. And so this man, he was, I love it, he was willing to listen to someone that worked for him. He was willing to listen. He was a man willing to listen to a woman. I'm going to say all the ladies said, amen. Come on, guys. He was a man willing to listen to a woman. He was a person willing to listen to someone that wasn't on his same education level. He was a person willing to listen to someone that wasn't on his social status. I need to tell you something this morning. It's time to listen to some people that you might not think are on your level, but they might have a word for you, and you need to listen. They might not be in your circle, but they might have something, and you need to listen. And sometimes we can't go to the next level in life because we're listening to the wrong people. I said sometimes we can't go to the next level because we're listening to the wrong people. What are people telling you? What are you listening to? Naaman got better because he listened to someone that was rich in the area that he was poor in. That's why he got better. And so Naaman, he... He gets all his chariots and he gets all his horses and they get a letter and they send it to the king of Israel and they say, hey, you know what, we're coming for you. And the king starts freaking out because he doesn't, know, he's like, I don't know how to heal this man. He starts ripping off his robe and he starts getting scared. And in verse 5, verse 8, 2 Kings 5, 8, it says, Elijah, a man of God, heard what happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he ripped his robe to shreds. He went to the word, to, he, he sent a word to the king. Why are you upset ripping your robe like this? Send him to me so he's going to learn that a prophet, there's a prophet of Israel. So he said, he's going to learn today. Say, we're going to learn today. You're going to learn something today. And so Elijah's saying, I can do this. I got this. I'm going to take care of it, baby. Send him to me. And you might say, that's cocky. No, he was just confident. You might say he's arrogant. No. Arrogance is whenever you don't know who actually, you don't give credit to actually someone that gave you something. And Elijah did. He always gave God the credit. And so in verse 9, Elijah, he, he, he goes, he, he takes all the chariots, all the horses, and he pulls up to Elijah's house. Naaman did. Sorry, I said Elijah. But Naaman got all his chariots. He pulled up to Elijah's house. And this is my favorite part of the whole story. I love it. My favorite part, verse 10, it says, Elijah sent out a servant to meet him with a message. He didn't even come out. He sent a servant out. You might, 
Put yourself in Naaman's, oh, I'm going, and I'm about to get healed from this leprosy. I'm about to talk to, the, to a, sir, a prophet of God. And Elijah, they pull up to his house, and he sends a servant out. Can I tell you something? Some of us are looking for answers from God. We're looking for God to give us a word, and it's someone else is going to tell us. Maybe from our parents. Maybe, maybe from our spouse. The Holy Spirit works through your spouse, I promise you. Sometimes my wife, she tells me something. I'm like, man, that's the Holy Spirit. But we're always looking at answers from up and God to give us words of encouragement coming down. And really it's from someone right next to us. But we, we're so mad because it's not from God. But it says he sent a servant. He said this, go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. Verse 11, Naaman lost his temper. He turned on his heel saying, I thought he'd personally come out and meet me. Call on the name of God, wave his hand over the disease spot, and get rid of my disease. And I'm like, where did you get all that, Naaman? Where did you get all that? This represents someone who is overcomplicating religion. Does anyone know anyone that's always overcomplicating religion? Like, oh, I got to sit in the same seat, or God ain't going to show up to church, or I got to lift my hands a certain way. I prayed for this guy one time, and he was wearing a hat. And once I was about to lay my hands on him, he started taking off his hat. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I got to take off my hat. My mama, and I said, I don't care what your mama said. I said, leave your hat on because God's still going to touch you and he's going to heal you right here. But so many times we over, and that's great to take off your hat out of respect. But this guy, he wasn't a Christian at all. So, I mean, to get him to be like, hey, take off your hat and then watch this. He's always going to think that when he prays to God, he's got to take off a hat. But my God's going to show up whether I'm wearing a hat or not. So sometimes, sometimes we overcomplicate religion. And Naaman's overcomplicating it right now. But if God told you to do it, then you just got to do it. And some miracles are unnecessary in our life, even though we're given execution. Why? Because sometimes God's going to, uh, God has to perform a miracle, but really he did, would never have to perform that miracle if you just quit texting that person back. Or maybe God might not have to do a miracle in your life if you just quit showing up to the place you know you're not supposed to be. Or maybe God's supposed to perform a miracle and he should never have to perform that miracle because you're supposed to not be looking at the thing you know you're not supposed to be looking at. So many times we're waiting for God to do a miracle. And he's like, hey, if you just live by my word, I don't need to perform that miracle. And so we start overcomplicating things. And we, and we get our flesh and our spirit to start battling over each other. And there's going to come a point in your life where your flesh is going to try to overtake your spirit. And in that time, you got to figure out, what am I going to do in this situation? Because your spirit always has to go over your flesh. Always. And so Naaman is like, you want me to go dip in the Jordan? You want me to dip in the Jordan? The Jordan's nasty. Buffalo Lake is cleaner than the Jordan River. Like, you want me to go, come on, Lake Allen Henry is, is cleaner than the Jordan River. You want me to go to the Jordan? It's nasty. And in verse 12, he stomped off mad as a hornet. Write this down. Offense is about to get in the way of his only opportunity for his healing. Sometimes we're so mad at God that we're missing a blessing that he wants to give us because we're mad at him. We're so mad at the church and God can't give us a blessing because we're staying in the fence. We're so mad at our spouse for what they did two weeks ago that we're still holding against it, that God's trying to give us a blessing, but he can't because we're holding on to a fence. And Naaman's about to miss his healing because he is offended. See, God had to do it this way because Naaman saw what needed to be fixed, but God said, I got to do it this way because you see what needs to be fixed, but I also, which is leprosy, but also something else needs to be fixed, and that's your pride. And so you came to me to fix the thing that you know what it is, leprosy, but I'm going to fix that, but I'm also going to fix the thing that you can't see. Oh, I love it. Whenever we go to God and we under and we obey and we just do it and we execute it, God's not only going to fix the thing we go to him with, he's going to fix some things in our life that we didn't even know we needed. Are you here this morning? Come on, whenever you start praying and you ask God, God, I'm going to do it anyway, he's going to fix some things whenever you didn't even know that you had on you. Naaman didn't understand that his armor wasn't going to help him in this situation. He didn't understand that his um, net worth wasn't going to help him in this situation. He didn't understand that his social status was gonna, wasn't going to help him in this situation. Why? Because the things that we have aren't going to help us in some situations. It's who we're going to listen to. And God said, I'm the only one that can fix this. Not your money, not what's in your bank account, 
not who's standing beside you right now, but me only. God's like, we could have fixed this forever ago if you just quit arguing with me and just follow instructions. But we want to argue with God. And so in verse 13 and 14, I love this. He starts walking away, and his servant says this. He says, Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not the simple wash and be clean? Thank God for someone in his life that got him off the edge. We need people in our life that's going to tell us when we are tripping. Whenever we are acting a fool, we need people in our life, hey, come on, why are you acting like that? Why are you doing that? Why are you living like that? We need people in our life like that. So then he went down, he, he obeyed his servant, he went down, and he dipped seven times. And when, after he dipped seven times, he came up and he was clean. Now there's three things I want you to see that I want to look at of whenever we are going to just do it. Three things that are going to come our way whenever we decide, hey, I'm just going to do it. I don't, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it anyways. Three areas that are going to come. And number one is this, distractions. Whenever you make a decision to just do it, the devil and the enemy is going to send some distractions your way. He's going to send some distractions and let you know, hey, do you know what? This ain't going to work. And he's going to start putting people maybe that aren't supposed to be in your life. And he's going to make some distractions. And whenever you feel threatened, remember that you're not going down. The devil's going to try to threaten you with everything. But remember who your God is. Number two, detours. Naaman thought things were going to happen one way, but God had him go a different way. Detours. There are going to be detours. Whenever you decide, hey, I'm just going to do it, there are going to be some detours. And some people will actually never reach their destination in life because they can't handle detours. Have you ever been down a detour? I was on 82nd the other day and they were doing some construction and they made me turn off into a, into a residential area and I had to go through all these streets and houses and then I came out and then I was right where I was supposed to be. I could have went to that detour and stopped and not go right like they told me. I could have waited there and I probably would have been waiting there for two days. God knows sometimes whenever you need some detours. Whenever you could be waiting and you, nothing's happening for the longest time. And he's saying, listen, I told you to go this way. But some of us, it's easy to follow God, but sometimes it's hard to trust his path. And we got to trust the path. There will be detours, but we got to do it anyways. There's going to be roadblocks, but we got to do it anyways. And number three, the last one, and I'm done. Number three is delays. There's going to be some delays in your life. When you're believing God to do something, you don't feel like it, and you do it anyway, there's going to be some delays. Naaman had to dip seven times. Can you imagine Naaman, he just said, hey, go dip in the Jordan seven times, come up, and then go back down. He goes and he dips one time, he gets out, he goes, looks in the mirror, and he's like, dang, it's still there. And then he goes and dips again for the second time, he goes to the mirror, man, it's still there. Can you imagine doing this seven times, and on the sixth time, he's like, man, it's still not there. What if he stopped on the sixth time? You got to do it anyways. You got to keep on doing it. You got to keep on dipping. Even whenever you feel like it's not working, you got to keep dipping. Even whenever you don't want to, you got to keep dipping. Even whenever there's tears in your eyes, you got to keep dipping. Even whenever the enemy's telling you, hey, this isn't going to work, you got to keep dipping. Even whenever the enemy's telling you, hey, nothing's going to come to pass, you're just, this, you're just a waste of time, you got to keep dipping. Because why? Because my Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 31, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So you got to keep dipping even whenever you don't feel like it. Keep on dipping. And you got to keep dipping even whenever you don't think it's working. Why? Because seven in the Bible represents completion. And whenever you completely obey God, what was broken becomes whole. So you got to keep dipping. Look at your name and say, keep on dipping. Will you stand up on your feet with me this morning? Now, I know I've preached these last two Sundays on I don't feel like it. And that, that could be you in here. You don't feel like, you don't feel like coming to church anymore. You don't feel like serving a God that feels like he's distant, but he's not distant. He's for you. He's not against you. And there's so many things in life where we just don't feel like doing. But we gotta do it anyways. Because whenever we decide to do it, we're going to see the goodness of our God. He says, his goodness and his mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
all the days of your life. You're gonna get distractions. You're gonna get delays. But you know what? Keep on dipping. Let me pray for you. God, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. We thank you that even though we don't feel like it, God, we're going to do it anyways. Even though we don't feel like laying in here, laying here, we don't feel like laying here any longer. Even though we don't feel like dipping, we're going to keep on dipping. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, God. I pray that anyone in here that doesn't feel like it, that don't think they can go any longer, God, that you will just invade their space, invade their heart, and be the God that's going to heal them. Just like you did Naaman as he dipped seven times, God, we are going to completely obey your word. And we're going to keep on doing the thing that you called us to do. And that is to keep on going. Keep on moving forward. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for Harvest Church. And I pray that Pastor Brack and my dad, God, that you are just going to bring him home safely. And whether they liked me or not, it doesn't matter, God. But I just thank you for the call of God that's on his life and this church. And that you're doing things that we don't even know, God. And we're going places. We're changing faces like we, that used to be our old slogan, God. But I pray that you are the God that's going to do amazing things in this church in Lubbock, Texas. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. How many of you received the word this morning? Amen. Give Brody a round of applause. Something that he said this morning that really jumped out at me. He said, if it's not better... God's not finished. Say that with me. Say, if it's not better, then God's not finished. Amen. That's a word. That's an anointed word right there. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Brody. We love to hear anointed preaching and teaching. Uh, This Wednesday night, uh, I'll be up speaking for you. So if you get off work and you're able to come, come this Wednesday night. Also, we will have Italian chicken before and after service in the uh, JJ bar for only $4. So come up, come early, get you some food, some natural food, and then um, come join the service. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>